morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Welcome to Bethel. My name is Janet Anderson. My husband Greg and I have had the awesome privilege of serving the Lord by serving students, staff, and families at Inspiration Point for over 30 years. We've also been blessed to be involved at Bethel Church, both in Fergus Falls and Battle Lake. Every week, I'm thrilled to hang out with fourth and fifth grade students in Fergus Falls at Magnify. I'm glad to be here with you today and would like to highlight a few things before we begin worship together. Today is a great day. In Battle Lake, we're so excited to be holding worship the second week in a row at our new facility. What a blessing to gather in this beautiful space God has provided to worship, to hear His Word, and to be sent out again. Praise God! Also, in Battle Lake today, our second graders are receiving their very own Bibles at the 1030 service. As you see them, encourage these kids and pray for them as they continue to read and grow in God's Word. So, I mentioned earlier that I'm honored to serve my Savior through the ministry of Inspiration Point. And today, we are excited to have camp staff at Bethel and Fergus Falls to share about the ministry of iPoint. Our mission at Inspiration Point is to provide time, space, and biblical teaching so people can encounter and follow Christ. We've had a front row seat to watch many campers trust Jesus for the very first time, while others have time and space to ask questions, gain understanding, and grow deeper roots in their faith. Praise God! Here's a glimpse of what camp looks like and some powerful testimony from some campers and staff. I learned that Jesus is our rock and He will never fail us. No matter how much we sin, He will stay strong. I like to come to camp because of all the opportunities you have, like zip lining, swimming, and all the fun things. I learned the story behind like how Jesus died on the cross. I've read and heard about it, but during that Christ height, I actually felt like I experienced it and I was there. I learned that in Christ we have hope, and our hope is secure, and it's also living, so like, what better thing to put our trust in? And I learned a lot more about the Bible and how important it is. Like, If you're doubting something or anything like that, it's really nice that you can just go to the Bible every day for that. Since working on staff, it has totally changed the way that I live my life. Everything I do in life, just as God's Word commands us, is through the lens of the Gospel. It's just an amazing camp. It's so fun, and I really would recommend it for all you who are watching this. Church, I can testify that lives are changed at camp. Scholarships are available. You can contact the Bethel office or the iPoint office for more information. And please, visit with our staff in the Fergus Falls Atrium today and on March 10th in Battle Lake. We're excited to be here and to answer any questions you might have. And finally, a reminder that there are weekly Lent gatherings at both campuses on Sunday nights through March 17th. Come and gather at 5.15 p.m. for a potluck-style meal. Bring something to share with others. Then, at 6 o'clock, in Battle Lake, we'll continue with a Bible study, and in Fergus, we'll have a short worship service. Both gatherings are centered around our Lent theme of love stories, pictures of the passion from the cross. So come, be reminded of God's love for us as we gather for a meal and reflect on Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. Sunday nights, starting at 515. We'll see you there. Friends, God's Word tells us that we are the body of Christ. Before we worship together, listen to Romans chapter 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing praise to Him now. Let's worship Jesus together. Hey, 
Hey everyone, Pastor Dave Foss here. Thanks for connecting with us today at Bethel. It's my prayer that this message be something that God uses in your life in conjunction with you belonging to a local church. We believe that online messages can help fill the gap when worship in your local church just isn't possible on a given weekend. Maybe you're traveling, maybe you got some health stuff going on, whatever the reason, isn't it great that we can connect like this? It is, and we're happy to share this online resource with you to encourage you till you can meet back here with us at Bethel or wherever your faith family is gathering. So again, thanks for connecting with us today and hope to see you soon. Well, good morning, everyone, and good to be with you. And hey, those of you joining us at Bethel Battle Lake, good morning to you. Oh, man, it is so great to be with you this morning. I wish I could be with you in person. I have, I have seen the pictures, and the space that we get to worship in looks fantastic. And I got to tell you, as beautiful as the pictures of the building have been to see, the pictures of you in the building have been the best, because it's about you and the mission of Jesus to the people of the Battle Lake community. So, so awesome. So excited to be with you this morning. If you're tuning in online, welcome to you. Glad you're with us today. Okay, so here's what I want us to do. I want you to imagine something with me from the start. Um, I want you to imagine with me this scene. You wake up one morning and you turn on the radio and you tune into local station KBRF talk radio, and you hear the following interaction with the radio host. Here's how it sounds. Radio host says, good morning, listeners. Hey, today we have some amazing news to share with you. Joining us on the show today is a very special guest, none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Now, Jesus, hey, we have heard that you are coming to town to speak. Is this true? And can you tell us more about the event? Jesus says, well, absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to announce that I'll be preaching in town very soon. It's an opportunity for everyone in Ottertail County to come, be together, be challenged, and be inspired, and just connect with each other. Well, that sounds incredible, Jesus. Can you give us a sneak peek into what you will be talking about? Well, I don't want to give away any surprises, but uh, it'll be some straight talk about God's love, priorities for life, and, and what we can look forward to in the future. Well, those certainly are topics that resonate with many people today. So tell us, Jesus, who's invited to this event? Hey, everyone is welcome. Church people, non-church people, just come. Okay, great, Jesus. So tell, tell us, how can people find out more information about this event? Well, they can check out our website, check out flyers, and uh, just reach out to local churches for details. Well, there you have it, folks. Jesus is coming to town, and it promises to be a terrific event for our community. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jesus. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. I look forward to seeing everyone. Okay, so just imagine. Just imagine that Jesus is a guest and a talk show host, uh, with a talk show host here in town, and he's, and he's doing an interview about coming to town. L- let me ask you this question. If Jesus were coming to town to preach, if Jesus were going to be here, by a show of hands, how many of you would be there? How many of you would come? Pastor Nick, tell me later how many in Battle Lake are raising their hand. Do we have everybody's hands raised? Please tell me everybody's hands raised. Would you not come? Please tell me that if Jesus were coming to town, you wouldn't say, well, yeah, as long as I'm not busy, I'll be there. Or... Well, it depends on which church he's speaking at, right? Come on, come on. If Jesus were coming to town, we would want to hear him preach, right? What would he say? We wonder what he would say. But here's the thing, here's the thing. We don't have to wonder what he would say. We've actually been as a church going through one of his sermons in this book, the Bible, and we've been seeing what Jesus has to say. And it's been so good for us as a church to look at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to dive into that again today. Uh, Matthew 6 is where we'll be. Here's, here's our text for this morning. Here's our text. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is preaching. And Jesus said this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Would you pray with me? Lord, um, yeah. thank you for your way of cutting through the noise and speaking to the things that really matter. Thank you for your ability to speak to us. Lord, I pray that in these next minutes, you would have your way in our hearts and lives. Use this message to bring the message of Jesus to us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to start the message today. I want to, I want to kind of summarize with two statements what Jesus is saying. Here they are. One, Jesus is saying that we all invest in something. We all invest in something. And two, the best investment is the investment that makes an eternal difference. So again, the first thing is this, that we all invest in something. We all have the same resources. We may not have the same amount of those resources, but we all have the same resources. We all have time. Now that's one in which we all have the same amount. We all have time and energy and money and abilities. And again, we may not have exactly the same amount, But we have them, and we're called to steward them, to use them, to invest them in things that matter. God calls us to invest them, and we do. We invest them in lots of ways. We invest them in vacations. We invest them in sports, in hunting, in grandkids, uh, in entertainment, in church, in school. And some of the investments we make with these things that God has given us make an eternal difference. And some of them do not. Now, he goes on to say that the, that the best investment for us is the investment that makes an eternal difference. Why this kind of investment? Why an eternal investment? Three reasons today. Three reasons. Security, yield, and wellness. See if this doesn't make sense to you as we go through it. First of all, security. Um, Jesus is making the point that the stuff that we have down here doesn't last. It doesn't really endure. Treasures on earth, while good, they just don't last, right? Things happen to our stuff. Stuff happens to our stuff. And, and it did in Jesus' day too. Jesus said in the text, he says, you know, moths, you know, people, moths got at people's clothes back then. Uh, rats and mice would eat at stored grain, and ants and worms would wreck whatever they put underground, and thieves break into their home and steal what they kept there. In other words, nothing was safe in the ancient world. Nothing was safe. But now we today, we today, how is it for us? Well, today we've got insecticides and pesticides and rat poison and mouse traps and rustoleum and ring doorbells. So we're fine, right? We don't, we don't have to worry. Is that, is that the case? Jesus is like, no, actually. It really doesn't matter what generation you live in. We're not any better off today. You still lose it one way or another. He says in verse 19, in fact, say this verse out loud together with me, church. Let's say it. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Okay, so why an eternal investment? First of all, security. Now, secondly, yield. Let's just say that we want to make an investment and we want some rate of return on our investment. What would be, um, what would be a return that you would be happy with? Maybe 10%? Uh, would, would a 12% return be something you'd be happy with? I mean, in a super, you know, really thriving economy, just a busting economy, an economic boom, maybe 30%? would be amazing, right? But Jesus says in Mark chapter four, he talks about how when we invest the gospel in the lives of people, when we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ into the hearts and minds of people, it yields 30, 60, 100 times. There's a hundred fold return. That's, that's 3,000, 6,000, 10,000% return when you invest the gospel. Here's how he puts it in Mark four. Others like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. In other words, Jesus is saying this. When we invest in others, 
when we share the gospel, when we sow the seed of the gospel in the hearts of people, it can have this ripple effect such that the impact from sharing the gospel affects thousands of people over many generations in time. It has just that kind of power. You change a person, you change a family. You change a family, you change a town. You change a town, you begin to change a generation. This is the impact, he says. And so investing in the gospel, which lasts, and investing in people who last, he says, invest in that. Verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So again, the contrast is between earthly treasures and heavenly. Okay, so why this investment? I said three reasons for security, then yield, and then thirdly, wellness. Wellness. What Jesus is talking about here is really interesting. He's saying that investing, our investments, have a direct effect upon our spiritual well-being. He he taught that our, our heart, right, our loves and our affections follow our investments. He said it this way, verse 21. Say it with me, would you? Say it with me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, in other words, Jesus is saying that you make a choice and what you give your time and your energy and your money and your abilities to, just watch, your heart will begin to follow those things. If I place my abilities, my soul, like like all of who I am in, in this, my money, my talent, my abilities, my energy, my time, if I invest it here, my heart will naturally be drawn to that over time. Now, many people say, well, Jesus, didn't you kind of get this backwards? See, some people would say, you know, well, dedicate the heart and the money will follow. And Jesus says it's just the opposite. He says that if your treasure is dedicated, your heart will be dedicated. It's it's a value system thing. This is what Jesus is saying. What are the values that operate in your life? And I would just like to say, I think it is so important to establish eternal, heavenly values enduring values early on in life to avoid some of the disillusionment that can come into your life later on. Begin while you're young. In fact, I would say young people, hello, young people, pay attention. If you're sitting next to somebody who's young, give them one of these, sharp elbow, go boom, pay attention to the preacher, look at him, right over there, do it, right, not that hard. This is church, for crying out loud. Take it easy. But you know what I'm saying? I get these young people's attention. If you don't know if they're young, uh, then don't bother. You know, you, you might hurt them. But I want, I want the attention of young people. Because here's what happens. Invariably in life, there's this well-known disillusionment that sets in for people between the ages of 35 and 50. It's called a midlife crisis. I don't know anything about that, but I read about it somewhere. Okay. There's this, there's this disillusionment that sets in between 35 and 50. And it's the idea that where you sort of you sort of despair of life and kind of where you're at in life. And you kind of look back on the things that you've been doing and the life that you've built and the things you've invested in. And you're like, either they're just not worth investing in or it just didn't work out the way you had hoped. We call that a, a midlife a crisis. Somebody put it like this. Somebody said, it's like you've been climbing a ladder. And it felt good to climb the ladder until you realize that the, that the ladder that you've been climbing is leaning against the wrong wall. It's kind of like that. And when I thought of that, I thought, you know, that sounds a lot like the experience of a guy in the Bible named Solomon. Do you remember Solomon in the Old Testament? I want us to remember him a little bit today. I remember the lessons that Solomon learned in the book of Ecclesiastes. You remember the book of Ecclesiastes? We went through it a few years ago. And the book opens like this. Here's how it opens. Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. What's that? That's what a guy in a midlife crisis says. That's what, that's what, doesn't that sound like a guy with a midlife? In fact, if you've, if you've got parents between 35 and 50, you should get that and put it on a t-shirt and give it to them. Give them a little head start so they can just feel that midlife crisis coming on, right? But this is, this is what it is. Solomon has climbed the ladder. Solomon's been climbing the ladder. He's been rising in wealth and power and success only to realize that his ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. And he's just 
What in the world am I doing and why am I here and what am I living for? Meaningless. He says that he's been invested in these earthly things. This life under the sun, the stuff that's down here. Not the, not the life above the sun, but life under the sun. And he says it's meaningless. The way he puts it in Hebrew, it's the word hevel. Remember that word? Hevel. If you want to say it right, you kind of need to say it like this. Hevel. You want to try that on the count of three? Wait, before you do it. What, what really works is get a little phlegm in the back of your throat. It, and then say, but just don't spit it out when you say it. If you've got a cold, it's really easy to, to do this. But you ready? On the count of three, we'll say hevel. Ready? One, one two, three. Hevel. Don't you just sound smarter? It's, it's a Hebrew word, and it means, in some cases, it means meaningless. Some Bibles translate it vanity or emptiness. Um, throughout the Bible, it has this idea of a vapor or a mist, this kind of fleeting, wispy thing, kind of like this, kind of like a puff of hot breath on a frosty February morning in 2023, because it's not that frosty in 2024. But you know what I mean? It's like you breathe and there's a breath and then phew, it's gone. It's there and then it's, then it's gone. It's just like that. He says, this is, this is what I see. All that I've invested myself into, it's hevel. It's just, it's no good. And this is his problem. In in Ecclesiastes 1 and Ecclesiastes 2, he describes this grand experiment that he has going on in which he tries these different approaches to life. And here's, here's how I want you to think of it. He does this. I want you to think of his shoes. It's like what Solomon does is he's like, he kind of like places his feet into a different pair of shoes and then he kind of walks around in them a little bit. He kind of walks around to see where it's going to lead him and he just, he figures out where that takes him. And then he does it again. He kind of puts his feet into a different pair of shoes and he walks around in them a little bit to see where it leads and he tells you the grand result of his big experiment in life. Here's what he tried. He tried wisdom. He tried, what? He tried knowledge. He, he looked for meaning in life by just you know, seeking smarts, trying to be intelligent. I'll get, a, I'll get a good education. I'll get a master's degree in living life on planet Earth. Problem is, he didn't take any of the courses God was teaching, and the result was predictable. The result was, he says, then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom, but I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. Chavel. Meaninglessness. And then in chapter two, he, he, he tries filling his life with various pleasures. Uh, he says, I, I, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find what is good. And, and what kind of pleasures did he try? First of all, he tried Laughter. He tried having fun. He's like, you know, life is too depressing to take seriously. So what should we do? Let's tell some funny jokes. Let's go to parties. Let's watch some TikTok videos. You know, anything to get a good laugh. But, but what is the result of that? This is what he says. I love it. He says uh, in verse 2 of chapter 2, it is foolish to laugh all the time and having fun doesn't accomplish anything. <laughs> Wow, kind of dark, you know, like, oh, wow, you're, I'm not going to bite you over next time for my party. But this is how he sees it. It's like, really, what a waste. Uh, what else does he try? He tries drinking. He says, I tried cheering myself with wine. I tried cheering myself with wine. If the TikTok videos aren't working, maybe I'll tip back a few and maybe that will help and I'll feel better. The key word, Tried. I tried cheering myself with wine. Listen, numbing your pain with alcohol is a dead end. Take it from Solomon. Take it from Solomon. What else does he try? Projects. Projects. How many, how many of you like projects? Raise your hand. You like doing projects. I got my hand up. I like, I like trying those things sometimes. They're fun. Uh, he says, I've, I've done them too. Verse 4, he says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. Verse 5, uh, I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. Is it good to undertake projects? Yes, especially the ones your wife tells you you should do. Absolutely. Those are sanctified projects. You should, you should always do them. But here's the problem with projects. Two, of, two problems with projects. One, they never end. And two, they never turn out exactly the way you had hoped. This is the problem with projects. And this is what Solomon found out as well. So what else does he try? He said, I tried music. He says in verse 8, I acquired male and female singers. 
What a strange thing to say, by the way. I acquired, I acquired male and female singers. Why did he acquire them? Well, he didn't have Spotify. He didn't have Apple Music. But Solomon could afford to throw the best concerts in the King's Castle. King's Castle acoustics to boot. What amazing concerts I'm sure they were. But he tried, he tried to fill his life with music. What else did he try? He tried it with sex. He's tried sex. He says, in verse 8, I acquired a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. Scripture records elsewhere in 1 Kings chapter 11, actually verse 3, some of you are going to look it up later. Uh, he, the Bible records the fact that he had like a thousand sexual partners. A thousand. He had like, like 300 wives and like 700 concubines or Maybe it was the, I don't remember, maybe it was 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure he knew. He's like, I'm sure he was introducing, like, you look familiar. Yeah, you know? Uh, but, I mean, it's like, we, we look at that and we go, ridiculous. And it is, and it is. What else did he try? Uh, earning money. Money, 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 money. Verse 8. I amass silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. Solomon was rich, like, like crazy rich. And what does he think about that? What does he think about all his wealth? The more he thinks about his earthly treasures, the more frustrated he is knowing that one day, someday, when he dies, somebody else is going to get it. It's just driving him absolutely batty. He says in verse uh, 18, I hated all the things I had worked for here on earth because I must leave them to someone who will live after me. And then he says, they did not do the work, but they will get everything. This is also unfair and useless. He's like, man, that is so unfair. I do all the work, but somebody else is going to get all my stuff. And they didn't have to work for it. He's so upset that you, you can't take it with you. Okay, so this is what Solomon tries. Again, he puts on all these shoes. He tries this. He tries that. He's moving around, looking to see where it leads. And he, in the end, after this grand experiment to to try and find meaning, to invest in these things down here under the sun, he does the math, right? Does the math, calculator, puts it all in, brr, hits, bing, here's the result. Here's what he says, verse 10 and 11. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done. The word surveyed here is the Hebrew word pana, pana, and it, and it means literally to face, to stare something right in the eyes. When I faced, when I surveyed all that my hands had done uh, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. In other words, Solomon found that the only thing wor worth investing your life in is what reaches above the sun. Investing in eternal things. Solomon found out that the earthly treasures we have down here just don't do it. He found that you can have a full fridge, a full house, a full closet, a full bank account, a full resume, a full social life, a full mind, a full liquor cabinet, and a full bedroom, and still have an empty soul. He found out that the only thing worth investing your life in is what lives eternally above the sun. Yes, the gravitational pull of the earth is down, but the gravitational pull of scripture is up. Jesus says in verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Okay, I want, I want to close the message this morning uh, like this. Acknowledging that, acknowledging that Jesus knows all about what it's like to live life under the sun. You see, he, he himself was pulled down by the gravitational force of his love for we who find ourselves here under the sun. He came down here to be our way to live life with him above the sun. Have you, have you ever asked the question, why did he come? 
Why did Jesus come down here? Why did he come down here to be with us? Because what's true for us is true for Jesus, which is to say, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus came down here because we are his treasure. Let me say that again. Jesus came down here because we, you and you and you and you and you and you and me, we are his treasure. Isn't that something? And it's amazing how the scripture has a way of flipping the script on us. And here we thought this was going to be all about how we need to get our priorities straight and live for eternal things and get it right, try harder, do more. And we find out that in the end, the message is really this, that we are the treasure that Jesus gave everything, invested everything to have. He invested everything, even his life, so that you could be his treasure laid up in heaven? Wow. He spent everything so that you could be his treasure laid up in heaven forever. Church, make no mistake. You are his treasure. And because you are, you could sing this. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure thou art. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for this amazing good news um, that you saw us as worth having and worth investing in, worth giving all that you had to save and deliver unto yourself that we would be your treasure laid up in heaven forever. Oh, Lord, what what can we say but thank you? And that that would then be what changes our attitudes and our hearts as we think about what it means to invest our time and our money and our energy and our abilities in things that you've given us to do that last forever, to invest in the work of the gospel and the people of this world who live forever. Lord, help us in that. Help us to be the kind of people who understand this principle of the treasure. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. And so now as you go from this place, uh, wherever it is that you're gathered today listening, I-, I want you to know that God loves you, and there's, there's just nothing you can do about that. But there's something that you can do with it. You can take that message of God's love for you, that you are his treasure that he, he thought was worth investing in, and uh, share that with the people around you who need to know that God loves them too. And as you do, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. God's peace be with you.